how to get you set up with the right equipment that works properly and uh, will enable you to learn as best you can. So you've been, um, I mean, how many years were you working at Stringers before you came to violin school? Was I was there few, for two and a half years, yeah. Mm. Um, so long enough to learn all about beginner instruments um, from a violin specialist perspective as well. I'm not a luthier, but I am a person who knows a lot about beginner instruments. Right, and you must get an awful lot of people coming through the door saying, how am I going to start learning? What, what am I, I going to do to... Like, where do I start? <laughs> yes, yeah. So um, the first thing to do is to find out who is your nearest violin specialist. Um, in London, there are a handful. There are not many. Um, and uh, further afield, they get fewer and fewer um, further between. Um, so you want to find out who's closest to you that is actually a violin retail specialist. Um, the next thing you want to do is decide your budget. What are you comfortable with spending? Um, if you want to buy a decent beginner violin, the chances are you're going to spend about two to three hundred pounds all in for your first setup. So that should include your violin, your case, your bow, and also things like a shoulder rest and some rosin, which we'll talk about a little bit more in just a second. Um, you do have other options, lots of places will rent if you want something that is a little bit lower commitment, um, and that will vary a lot depending on the retailer. Um, how much they will charge for something like that. And that's going to be the same probably pretty much whichever country or city you're, you're, you're in, if it's a major city. Of course, we'll, t we'll talk about other places later because outside of big cities, it's, it's often hard to find a violin shop. Um, but in terms of, of dollars, you're looking at maybe up to $400, something like that. It yeah. um, would be really interesting actually to find out um, what, how that translates to other, other countries because, of course, it's very different in very different places. Um, and, you know, at Violin School, we help a lot of people who don't live near um, a major city. So, for example, a lot of our learners live in you know, areas which are often quite a long way um, from, from a big city. So, what would you recommend, um, if, if it's not practical, particularly in this sort of time of coronavirus, to get to a, a violin shop? Where would you suggest that, that people start in terms of online buying? Okay, so um, if there is a retailer in your state or your country, um, that's probably a good place to start because the less distance that a violin has to travel to you, the less risk of damage in transit. Um, so if you were, for example, if you were in the UK in a very rural area, what I would say to you would be to go online and have a look at the specialist retailers in your country. Find out what options they have, maybe give them a call because they usually, I'll let that truck go past, they're usually very happy to speak to you and, and talk you through your options. So call them up, have a chat or send them an email. And uh, once you've identified the right instrument for you, have them send it to you. Um, the chances are you'll have to purchase it before you do that, but uh, most of them will also insure the instrument for the postage uh, period. Um, so you should still be able to get a good instrument, but it's important to do your research and actually speak to some people before you commit to an instrument. So let's let's take it back to basics. And um, often I find when people are starting to think about playing for the first time, even just knowing what's what is a bit of a challenge. So why don't you talk us through actually what we've got here? So there are lots of different parts of the violin. Each of them has different function. Um, where would you generally start introducing people to what's going on here and what's what and how um, it works? So the, my usual sort of line of attack really would be to start at one end of the instrument and work the way through to the other. So I'd say to you, this part, this part here at the top, this is called the scroll. And if this is really, really messy, that actually is a really good giveaway that the violin is not well made. Um, that does go for finer instruments as well, but it's very, very detailed. So if you're not very very experienced with it it will be difficult to tell but if it's just really obviously not right here the chances are something else isn't quite right either these parts here they can be brown or black um, they're usually made of ebony even on uh, stand, sort of starter instruments uh, from various different places usually ebony um, and they're called your pegs what they do is they help you to tune the strings. Now they're a little tricky to use, we might talk about that in a second, but um, let's move on for now. So if you go down from the pegs, you have the neck of the violin. There's sort of two parts to the neck. You have the neck neck, and then you have 
the black part here at the front, which is called your fingerboard. Again, that needs to be really, really finely um, sort of shaped, even for a beginner instrument, instrument, because it affects how how much space you have under the strings and how easy it is to play the violin. If your strings are too high, they're going to be really hard to press down, and especially if you're looking for a children's instrument, that's a big problem uh, because they just don't have the same as an adult's strength and they find it very difficult to press the string down. If you can't press the string down, you can't make the right sound. The strings start here at the pegs. They go over a little lip here called the nut. Again, that's separate from the fingerboard. Go down the fingerboard, so follow them all the way down here to this part. This is your bridge. You can see that if I turn it that way, more like that. The bridge is one of the most important things that affects the playability of the instrument. Um, your strings, run over the bridge and into your tailpiece. So your bridge needs to be a really good shape so you get a nice curve over the top um, so that you can cross all the strings with the bow. So if I take my bow now um, and show you, if I were to drag my bow across the strings, that makes them vibrate. If the curve isn't quite right, you're going to bump into other strings, you're going to make some unpleasant noises. So it needs to be decently done. The bridge is not held on with any glue. Um, it's just held on with the tension of the strings above. So sometimes um, something that can happen that can be a little bit alarming is if it's too hot or too cold or too humid especially, things move around because it's all different types of wood so things change sizes. And your strings can go slack and your bridge can fall off. And a lot of beginners will run straight back to the shop and go, there's something hor horribly wrong with my violin. I don't know what's happened, it's broken. Um, and it's not broken, you just need to put it back up. But again, that's something that's easier to do once you've seen it done a couple of times. Um, so I would still suggest, if you can, go to a, um, a specialist that, or, or another violin player can usually do it, someone who's got a bit more experience. Um, but we did have to do this online this summer with uh, some of our beginners who um, had this problem during lockdown and uh, we were actually talking through it. Hasn't it? Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. we've had to really get learners to try and work out these things for themselves but traditionally it's been easier to say well look, that's quite a complicated thing to do go to a violin shop or go and ask yeah. a teacher or as you say somebody more experienced that's another great reason to be part of a good learning community like violin school he said getting the promo in right there violinschool.com check it out um, but I think that what we found to be really quite interesting through the lockdown period is that um, actually being forced to learn how to tune or how to set up the instruments has given people um, almost like a, a deeper level of understanding about how, yes. how it all fits together. Yeah, yeah. And then they're a lot more comfortable if, if something doesn't go quite right or, mm. or something changes or there's a big noise uh, often if you don't know what you're looking at it can be quite scary um, and if you've had to tune with your pegs a few times already you start to understand what's really going on what's really a problem and what actually mm. isn't worth panicking over and it's been quite interesting as well for us to learn like these new ways of doing things and I think particularly in the world that we're living in now it's what it's all about um, so this obviously is a test um, I don't know whether anyone's watching but if you are um, please feel free to send us questions we are going to do more and more of these interactive sessions um, and if you have a question or even if you'd just like to say hello say hi and where you're watching from um, uh, but if you have any questions about how the setup of the violin works, then please um, let us know. So essentially, this, this, this um, live stream is all about how to get started with the violin. And that's the name of a free course that we have as part of our courses here at Violin School. And it's all about really connecting with people who are thinking about learning the violin, or maybe have decided to learn the violin but haven't got a violin yet. Um, so even before you start thinking about actually learning and getting started with playing, it's really just knowing your way around the thing, <laughs> the instrument, the box, um, feeling comfortable with it. And that's particularly important with a violin um, because traditionally the violin's been seen as quite a comp complicated instrument. Like there's a, there's a lot. Um, there's a lot that goes on, like all these different bits and pieces. So knowing how that works um, is, is, is really, really important for making sure that you're starting without getting any bad habits in. Because even just a small like error with the setup can actually really um, be a negative um, in terms of how you get started with playing, right? Yes. I mean, what do you find are some of the most common bad habits that come from bad setup? 
Um, I wouldn't say it's so much bad habits in terms of what the learners will, will pick up, but it's more things just won't happen and you'll start to think that it's you and you're not playing right and you're not understanding, but actually it's the instrument that's letting you down. Um, so a really common one that we see with violins that are set up by uh, let's say um, let's say a, a very early career luthier who's really just starting it's their first ever bridge and it's not gone quite right um, probably the most common thing is that the A string this one here so your third one from the left if you're looking here um, will be too low down so this bridge instead of being a nice curve like that lowering down onto the E string it will kind of be really high and then just kind of go flat and that means that you won't be able to play the A string on its own. You will only ever be able to play the strings on either side of it at the same time, or if it's bad enough only, uh, but I haven't actually seen that very many times. Um, but yeah, it's a very, very common problem. It, there's usually an, an, an easy enough way to fix it. If it's only a small difference, you can get a little patch put on the, on the bridge, which is called a vellum. Um, but that depends on how much difference you need to make. So sometimes it's an easy fix for your retailer to do for you and sometimes you need to go with a slightly different instrument or get a new bridge done. So this is, um, this is why I would always say go to a specialist because they will firstly do it right first time and secondly if there is a problem with it they'll be able to sort it out for you whereas your standard retailer will not know how to fix a violin. It's quite complicated. And a very practical point, it's also cheaper in the long run. I yes. mean, often you can save money on the um, initial instrument you get by getting one that's really bad, but then of course if you try and fix it, that's, it's going to cost yeah. more to fix, so it's actually um, um, cheaper in the long run to get set up properly. Yes. Um, and actually, I, I want to ask you on that note about beginner outfits, but before you do, if you're watching, if you have any questions, please, um, this is just a total test run, a pilot, if you like, of um, a regular series we're going to be doing about how to get started with the violin. Um, you can find, if you go to violinschool.com, we've got loads of resources there where you can find out all about how to get started. But we thought it would be really, really good um, to uh, get your questions and know exactly what you might be thinking about um, before you get started. So if you're thinking about playing the violin or you are decided that you're going to play the violin but you haven't got an instrument yet, please send us your questions, let us know um, what your biggest question is. We're here um, with the wonderful Marisol who um, is a real expert in these things having worked at a violin shop for several years before joining violin school. And we've only got a couple of minutes left now but I want to ask you a bit about beginner outfits because yeah. one of the things that when you're a beginner learner can be really helpful is just to know right I just go to this shop and I ask for that setup and those accessories done, sorted. I know it's going to be reliable. So what yeah. are beginner outfits? So a beginner outfit includes usually three things. There will be more things that you need, but we'll talk about those in just a second. The main three things that will come in a beginner outfit are your violin itself, which should have strings on. They can, you can buy violins that don't have strings on, but just go straight for one that does. Um, a bow, like this. So this is what you actually use in your right hand to, to make the sound. Um, and a case. Carry it around and keep it safe and uh, keep it safe from uh, getting wet or too cold or too hot. Uh, Simon has many, many cases here. Um, other things that you will need are a shoulder rest. It's actually really important, um, especially if you are an adult learner. If you're an adult learner, having a shoulder rest makes a massive difference. If you're, with smaller children, they can start with uh, a sponge, but uh, for an adult, you're going to need something like this. Now, this one in particular is called a wolf secondo. Uh, not everyone will find this very comfortable, but this is something that I've used for a long time, and I, I, it suits me. Um, I've got a couple of different ones, uh, depending on how I'm feeling, but this is the one I usually uh, put on. Um, your, your, whoever you get your violin from will show you how to put this on and off. Generally speaking, you slide it on long ways rather than trying to push it on and then pull it back off again because you'll damage the edge of the violin if you do that. Um, other things that are key for a beginner, um, you'll need some... Mm, before I go on to rosin, um, you want to have fine tuners on your tailpiece here. Lots of violins like Simon's, um, and because Simon is a more advanced player, he doesn't necessarily need them. So 
he doesn't have fine tuners except on the E string, which is the one where a small difference will make a biggest difference to the pitch of the string. Um, but these tuners are a lot easier to use than the pegs. The pegs are very hard work and they take some experience to get used to. Um, so you really want to make sure you have these. Almost every beginner violin will have these on here. Should have a chin rest as well. This is quite self-explanatory. That's where your chin sits when you put the violin to your shoulder. Um, and you'll need your bow and you'll need rosin for the bow. So I'm going to show you a rosin that I have here. This one is Gold Flex by Parastro um, and it's about £13. Um, it's about 16 17 US. Uh, something like that, yeah. I actually don't recommend this for beginners um, because it's very gritty and grippy. So you want something that's going to give you a good amount of contact on the string so that the bow isn't sliding all over the place, but um, you want something that's going to make it easy to make a nice smooth sound. So for that reason, I usually recommend Art Cap uh, it's Kaplan's Art Craft Rosin, and it's the light one that you want for violin. They do a dark one, but that's for viola and cello. So this is what your rosin will look like. It will usually have a cloth attached in some way or another. The Parastro ones always come with this little lid thing on the bottom. I'm not sure why, but um, you have your rosin cake in the middle. It's called cake. And don't eat it. No, don't eat it. Really don't eat it. Um, and you've got your cloth attached to it always. Sometimes they can come off, but you can really just glue it back on. It will be fine. The only point of the cloth is to stop your fingers from touching the rosin. Um, not because it's harmful, but because um, it's basically glue. In, in um, And when you, even if you've just washed your hands, the chances are that your skin will produce a little bit of oil. And if you touch it, it will pick up all of that oil. And actually, you can probably see that if you look at Simon's bow. Mine's, Mine's not too bad, actually. It's, it's been far worse in the past, yeah. but sometimes you see bows which have horrible amounts of grease all over the bottom. I'm yeah. sure if I look at yeah, one any of, one of those will have that. That's something that happens a lot, isn't it? That yes. People will touch the, um, um, the hair of the bow with their fingers, and that's not a good idea. Yeah. Exactly so the that way thing. that I always explain it is you don't touch the rosin. The rosin goes on the hair of the bow. You don't touch the hair of the bow. It's very straightforward. You just try not to touch it as much as possible. Mine's, mine's about in need of a rehair. You can just about see it's a little grey at the bottom because at the very end it's impossible not to touch it altogether. But what you do with your rosin, you take it like that and you just rub it on the hair of the bow like so. It makes it sticky. The hair of the bow is horse hair uh, and it has little teeth along it. It's just uh, the same as human hair. If you were to look at it under a microscope, you would see that it has these little jagged edges. Um, and the rosin makes those stand up and then they actually grip the strings. This is my ro <laughs> rosin <laughs> hair mine. We'll do a whole segment <laughs> on rosin because I, I think this is going to have to become a, a regular a regular slot because there's so much to say about so many of these things. Yeah. By the way, if you're watching you just joined us, please say hi, just scribble a hi so we know what you're watching. But also, if you've got any questions at all, we've got another, uh, oh, just another three or four minutes to run, but if you've got any questions that you'd like to know about getting set up, about instruments, now is your opportunity. There's an awful lot of knowledge over here in Marisol's head. Um, and it, I think we have to do a whole, whole segment on rosin, don't we? I mean, yes. just, just what you were saying there, I see so many people ha ha smash their rosins because they forget to um, cover that little metal bit at the end. That's yeah. another really common thing. Um, to get wrong and um, and yeah and with with the hair as well like it's so easy um, to get very very greasy there but then people end up worrying whether they should touch at all the hair mm. I mean what's your feeling about that because I, I don't like inhibiting people and say well you know you've got to try and avoid it because then you're going to get tension in the playing but it's I would just say that um it's when you're handling your instrument, usually when you're putting it in the case or taking it out to play, that's the time to be very cautious about what you're touching uh, and with what, and if you're gonna bump it on things and so on, that's the time to worry about it. But while you're actually learning, you, you know, you have to learn how to hold it and how to use it. So don't, don't panic if you do touch it. Um, I often find that the back of my thumb touches the hair of the bow like that. Same here. And that's fine. Because your your bow hair isn't permanent anyway. Um, depending on the price of the bow that you've bought, uh, and, and there's up to a certain level, it's not worth getting a new rehair. Um, but if you were to have a slightly more advanced instrument, you've been playing for a few years, you've bought yourself a nice bow, um, then you will want to take care of it by having it rehaired probably once a year, maybe a year and a half, something like that. Um, if you're playing a lot and you're a professional, it can be six months. 
It can or if be... you do what I do and go you and know, play Kaylee's and press way too hard, you can get through like half a bow hair yeah. in a night. I can. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so this isn't a, it's not a permanent fixture of the bow um, as long as it's a sort of decent quality. We're going to have to wrap up in just a moment, but before we do, just a quick reminder um, that um, if you have any questions, please um, let us know. We're going to be regularly um, encouraging people to um, tune in for more advice about how to get started with a violin, because um, before you join any of the courses that we run at Violin School, go to violinschool.com. Um, we've got a whole series of um, guides about how to get started. We're going to be covering a lot of the details in, in, in these um, talks as well, but um, there's, there's so, much, so much to know, but basically there are a few fundamental things which, if you get them right, you'll be starting off in the right way. Um, so do check it out, violinschool.com. Um, Marisol, I've got, I've got one question that I have to ask you before we finish. What happens to dead bows? So those bows that you can't afford to rehair, um, what does the violin shop do with those dead bows? I don't know if I can answer that question. All right. Well, in that case, I'm going to ask you again off camera. Okay. And we're going to see whether we can get yeah. some stuff. <laughs> what I will say is if you've got, um, if you're a teacher, actually, it's a really good, good thing to do. If you've got kids that have a broken bow, you can keep it. And then at Christmas, they can put a little ribbon around it and make it into a wand. Oh, lovely. Or something. Yeah. Good, good for practicing Halloween. conducting. As yeah, well, actually, yeah. Excellent. Thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. And join us again. We're going to be doing this again soon. So thank you to Marisol. I'm Simon. See you.